start with a quote from Larry Tesler. I'm, some people probably know who Larry Tesler is, um, but uh, I like this quote. Uh, and basically what Larry is saying is that whatever machines, uh, human intelligence can basically be quantified as whatever machines haven't done yet. So the thought is, is that machines will be doing more and more and our intelligence will be coming, we're going less and less. Um, I want to start with a story, a story that is not specifically AI, but mirrors AI. And so I'm starting with this particular story because as a kid, my heroes, you know, I was a weird kid. So my heroes weren't like, you know, uh, Superman, and I didn't read comics. I read lots of physics books, and so my heroes were physicists. Um, at the end of the conversation, I'll tell you guys about how I found out that J. Robert Oppenheimer actually lived in the same city that I did and about six blocks away, and I remember as a six-year-old kid knocking on these people's doors saying, did you know J. Robert Oppenheimer live here? And they're like, go away. Um, one of the things that uh, occurred, and this is, this is interesting, is, is when they were first refining plutonium, they refined it to a point of something called negative five, which was five within 5% of criticality, extremely dangerous. And it was actually done, of all places, in Hanford, just about 300 and some odd miles to the east of here. And that plutonium was formed into a sphere, uh, and it represented probably about 80% of the plutonium, uh, refined plutonium in the world at the time, and it was shipped uh, to Los Alamos. And they had to figure out, with this incredibly powerful, raw element, uh, they had to figure out a way to quantify um, uh, its ability to, pr pr to produce uh, a, a nuclear reaction or, or go to criti critical. And the way that they did that wasn't by you know, some you know, amazing instrumentation. They literally used screwdrivers and they had two beryllium uh, um, half spheres that they put over this, which is a reflector. And that's what, that's what actually contained it. Now, if you completely put it over the, the plutonium, it will go critical. You basically have an uncontrolled nuclear reaction right in your lap. Probably not a good idea. So in order to do that, you actually need to use uh, screwdrivers. Well, you probably come up with something better than a screwdriver, but the physicists at the time, our smartest and our brightest in the world, decided that they would use screwdrivers to shim this thing because you had to maintain some level of separation uh, so that this uh, device didn't go critical. And in this particular case, uh, they called the uh, plutonium uh, the dragon, uh, the, the, uh, the demon core. And uh, two of our greatest physicists at the time, um, uh, Enrico Fermi said, well, these guys will be dead within a year if they keep doing this. So you could probably call him the Elon Musk of AI. And another one of our uh, great um, physicists uh, said, well, you're basically tickling the dragon's tail. Don't worry, I'll get to how this relates to AI in just a second. So one of the uh, physicists uh, who was responsible for, uh, for this experiment, his name was Lewis Slotten, and he was using his uh, screwdrivers to, to shim, and he kind of became, as he, he did this, I mean, more and more people would gather around this danger uh, to look at what he was doing. And so he would walk into Los Alamos in his cowboy boots and kind of cavalier and he slotted. Well, one day, uh, the screwdriver, his amazingly technical implementation slipped. There was a room about eight people and the dome fell over the plutonium. In that instance, in that second, that plutonium became supercritical. When it went supercritical, the room flashed blue. And the reason why it flashed blue is because the air in the room instantly became ionized. Slotin realized what had happened, reached down with his hand, threw the, threw the, threw the uh, half dome off, and he did that uh, before, so the, the criticality only lasted for about a half second or so. So it was instant, instantaneous. Um, the other people in the room obviously were pretty freaked out. Slotin immediately went outside and he threw up. And he threw up because acute radiation syndrome was already kicking in. He died nine days later and he basically had a three degree burn inside of his system. It was a gastro gastrointestinal. Uh, and so it's a cautionary tale. And the reason why I bring it up is because you can have the greatest technology in the world with the most promise. And if we think about nuclear power and being able to harness 
uh, nuclear energy, we, we knew that this was something that had an incredible and immense power, but this is a, a, a perfect example of what happens when you don't respect that power, when you don't think about the implications, when you become too comfortable with it, when you don't see it necessarily as a tool. And so what we're gonna talk about today is about the threat of AI and the promise of AI. So that's the introductory story. Figure I'd start you off with a good one after lunch. So let's talk a little bit about the AI capability continuum. So we're here, we're at artificial neurointelligence. And what does that mean? I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys the, 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 the definitions. And this is generally what's known as the continuum of AI. It moves from artificial neural intelligence, uh, contemplates artificial general intelligence, uh, and then ultimately artificial super intelligence. And people refer them as ANI, AGI, and ASI. We're at ANI right now. So in terms of capability, artificial neuro neural intelligence is considered to be a weak form of AI. So we're kind of in the baby steps, if you will. I mean, we like to think that we've taken some, some great strides. Even greater strides are coming. No question about it. And I'll explain a little bit why. Um, but as you can see, um, ANI is largely single task. Um, very data set specific, uh, highly bounded. Um, AGI uh, is what's known as strong AI. My background is largely around quantifying human behavior. Uh, and so this is the thing that keeps me up at night. When we start to talk about uh, AGI, that's where you have a system that becomes self-aware and starts to integrate emotional intelligence. Um, it has unbounded uh, ability to reason can make judgments, and then of course, ASI. Now, I don't personally think that I'll see, I'm hoping I don't see ASI in, in my lifetime. I hope that my kids don't necessarily see it, but who knows, at the rate that things are moving, uh, you, you never know. But uh, at this point, uh, now we're talking about creativity, perception. So these are the, the, the general rules, but let me break this down a little bit, uh, a little bit easier. When we talk about A and I, we're talking about having something that is still largely controlled. We could talk about the implications of it, but we don't have AI that is, uh, is, is intelligent or has any semblance really of, of intelligence as we define it. But once we start talking about AGI, um, now we're starting to talk about why. Uh, and so with, with A and I, we have something, I'll give you an example. A and I, um, kind of you know, at the border, um, Google and, uh, and, and playing Go, right? So now you've got, uh, for, for the first time, and Go has always been thought of as a game which, which requires a certain amount of, of, of intuition. And there's no way that, the, that, that the, uh, the AI system employed is going to be able to figure out all the moves because there are more moves than there are atoms in the universe. Um, but by the same token, it's still largely using a, a rule construct. Um, it knows how to win, but it doesn't know why it won. When you get to AGI, now you're talking about understanding why. In order, in, order, in order to understand why, that means that you have to understand human behavior. So once we start to move into AGI, now we're talking about machines that are able to understand human behavior. And how does that happen? Well, we have a lot of data that we provide. We're constantly providing data, everything that we do, our buying habits, our purchases. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as, as well, uh, as specific application. But the point being that when you have enough of that data, uh, then the machine at this point, it understands why. And when you get to ASI, now the machine can start to predict and start to influence human behavior. So that's pretty deep if you think about it. First part where we are now, I can do things. I don't understand or know. I'm just following largely a set of rules where the data leads me. I am bounded. Once I'm in, AG, uh, once I'm in uh, AGI, I'm largely unbounded. I'm starting to understand. I'm starting to learn why. So when machines start to ask questions about why, um, are they becoming intelligent? Are they possessing uh, a, a certain sense of conscious? And then once we start to get to ASI, that's completely different. Then we have something that's actually, in theory, smarter than us. So 
do we have to really worry about this? I mean, we can put them up and say, well, these are the things that are coming, but let's just take a, a, a brief look at, at uh, AI time. And I realize that this is kind of a, a, an eye test chart. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, walk through um, you know some of the key elements, um, but basically, you've got the formal start of AI um, in 1956. So you had a group of uh, researchers that get together at, at Dartmouth. They're the they're they're known as the the fathers of of, of AI, and uh, and and they basically get started uh, uh, promoting AI as a science. Takes a few years. Um, but people are, in, are, are, are excited at the possibility, and lo and behold, uh, DOD starts funding, and you start to get a fair amount of academic research, and that happens within the span of five, six years. Um, what's interesting is, uh, and, and, and that initial group, Minsky and that initial group, those are the rules guys. So they basically um, thought of AI as a series of rules, uh, you know, tightly bounded, and so that's how AI was 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 envisioned. And there were, you know, pretty interesting developments. And you had, uh, you know, machines like uh, or, or programs like Eliza that capture people's uh, attention and imagination. But it just kind of petered out over a period of time. We went through a dark period of of AI, known as the AI winter. Uh, and and let's see, that's about here. Uh, progress slows. U.S. and Britain start to um, uh, reduce their funding because the promise of AI is not really being met. So you have some interesting things that are happening, but definitely not what, what people uh, had promised, uh, largely in academia. And then in 1981-85, uh, there's a resurgence. Uh, there's a renewed interest because uh, there was a different, uh, different train of thought. And this group of individuals were known as the connectionist. So now we start to move away from rules base and we start to move towards connection and data and expert systems. And so now you're starting to get a fair amount of interest and people are starting to, uh, to, uh, to take note. Uh, but then we get another second winter where things just slow down for like another six, seven years or so. Um, I don't know if people remember the Lisp machines, uh, but that market crashed and that basically was the end of AI for a period of, a period of time. And then finally, back in, uh, in, in 97, 2007, now there's, sorry, in, in 97, there was a new focus on, on AI. And the reason why that focus happened is because it was all about scale. The problem was that the rules, if you have a rules-based system, a rules-based system doesn't scale. But now that you had a lot of data, the connectionists were right. And so now, finally, you had something that actually could meet the promise. You had the ability to uh, take the connections theories and actually scale them up. We had lots of data. Uh, infrastructure prices came down. Uh, you had uh, you know, the cloud uh, or the, 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 the evolution of the cloud. So now you're starting to see this expansion. And that expansion was just really this acceleration, this massive acceleration. And so now we start to see in 2008, 2010, uh, AI applications are becoming a lot more mainstream. Moore's Law uh, and algorithmic improvements are and, and access to a large amount of data. So the more data that we got, the more AI and the more ML uh, we, we saw. Now, 2011, 2014, deep learning becomes a part of the big uh, ensemble. And Google uh, is incorporating uh, over 2,700 projects in 2015. At least that's what they had announced. Um, another thing uh, that, that happens, uh, 2015, 2016, China uh, enters the scene and decides that they're going to go full in on, on AI. Uh, and in doing so, uh, not just in terms of dollars, but actually finding the best and the brightest and actually uh, having uh, AI institutions, if you will, uh, to train the next generation. So you know, that, was, that was a, a huge focus. Uh, and, and still is. Um, we see that uh, uh, infrastructure costs continue to lower. And in just 2017, uh, survey one in five companies have incorporated some type of AI into their offerings or processing. Um, 2019, where we are now, we talked about deep learning. That's going to shift into even deeper math. So when we start to t look at things like the 
uh, gradient descent and trying to understand that. You're starting to see that that is going to be one of the things that will actually push AI even further. Field of study, and now the yellow are basically predictions. So uh, field of study, uh, it's already starting to shift that way. It's going to, I believe, it's going to move into something called machine behavior because the machines will start to exhibit behavior. Already, we find that our models are so complex that we can't necessarily understand them. Uh, but what will happen is AI will be studied uh, largely as a biological equivalent. And so as we move from rules-based to, uh, uh, to the uh, connectionist, I think what you'll start to see is you'll start to see behaviorism and behaviorist uh, start to uh, really start to push uh, uh, AI forward. Um, as a result, 2021, I think that um, that's where we're going to probably wind up um, seeing a very serious call for some type of regulation. I mean, we're starting to hear about it now and people are talking about it. But what it's going to take is, it's good, like everything, it's going to take an event. It's going to take us uh, doing a, 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 a slot in where we, um, where we go critical for a second. Something's going to happen, something bad. And then as a result, there'll be an overreaction and there'll be some type of call for, uh, for some type of regulation. Um, content generation by 2023, largely driven by, by AI. Programming decisions, uh, the type of content you get, highly personalized. I mean, we're already starting to see that infrastructure appear, right? I mean, I mean we're, we're moving away from networks and the way that we traditionally get information and we're moving into more personalized uh, means of, of that happening and uh, with all of the available uh, content that's out there that will largely be driven uh, in my estimation by AI. And I'm going on a limb here, that's not terribly unusual, but um, the first AGI, the first general uh, um, implementation, uh, I believe will be, will occur sometime in 2025, between 2025 and 2035, so I gave myself a fair amount of room there. Um, and I believe that that will occur in the healthcare and the e-finance space. So when we talk about threats um, with respect to, to AI, and it's not all bad stuff, right? That AI, I mean, AI does great stuff too. Um, but these are the things that we need to worry about today, like right now. Um, and these are the narrow AI threats. And those include things like militarized AI. And we've already, start, we've already started to see um, people... Uh, concerned about uh, militarized AI. Um, you've had people from large corporations that are saying, well, you know, certain types of recognition we don't think you should do. Uh, I don't want to necessarily be a part of that. Um, these are kind of obvious, but uh, cyber attack and organizational attack. And AI is going to do a far better job of figuring out a weak link or a strong link in an organization in terms of attack. So the good that it can do in identifying things, uh, it could also be bad. Manipulative AI, um, we'll start to hear a lot more about this. Um, uh, Matt Chesson actually uh, coined this term. He calls them MADCOMs, uh, machine-driven communications tools. But when we talk about deep fakes and things of that nature, that's going to become commonplace. Uh, and we'll have to use AI to also um, identify those because we won't be able to necessarily identify them. Same thing with, um, with written stories as well. Um, this is a term that I, I, I coined, uh, bad AI, uh, bias-affected and deficient AI. Um, most of the problems that we see with narrow uh, AI really has to do with the data sets that we, uh, that we use. Um, and if we're going to have problems or if someone wants to create a problem or introduce a problem into a system, they'll do it through the data. I mean, the algorithms are the algorithms. The algorithms don't know. It's the data that they use. Uh, and so these are the types of problems that we've seen. So if you have a chat bot and you decide that you're going to largely uh, um, go unsupervised and, and provide the, the, the data that uh, is organic, don't be surprised when that chat bot starts doing uh, interesting things and spouting you know, racist and, uh, and other, uh, you know, other things uh, in terms of its interaction with people. So um, with bad AI, we have to be concerned about um, recognition and suitability of determination. And then finally, um, another uh, uh, term that I'm, I'm using is inverse AI paradox. For everything that AI can do good, there's an inverse where it could do something in terms of the consequence. And so as AI practitioners, myself, all of you, we have to think about these things. We have to think about them uh, before we get started. 
uh, on any projects that we do. And ultimately, we have to realize that we're responsible for what we create. We need to think above and beyond the narrow set of parameters or the narrow problem that we're trying to address and think about what those implications will be. So, like I said, we need to recognize the social implications. We need to acknowledge our own limitations. That means that if you don't necessarily know, find someone that does. I'll give you an example. I'm working on a project where pretty much everybody in this room, I have data on, right? Because we went out, we bought that data. And we're doing that so that we can, you know, look at a large scale social uh, determinant of health system. And so we're making predictions about your health based on the food you eat, your activities, uh, you know, your level of education, the type of job you have, which indicates, you know, your, your, your level of sleep. That's all great. So this is wonderful in terms of the ability to maybe help people in terms of their lives, help t practitioners identify certain things. Um, but when I start to think about the social implications, for instance, does this mean that insurance agencies would potentially use this data to deny people um, a certain type of coverage? I realize, you know, I don't have the answers for this. So what I do, I started to go out and I started to talk to ethicists. I started to talk to people that were in public health. I started to talk to people and basically start to convene a group to think about how this could be used. Because a lot of times if we're working on something, we're only thinking about it from our perspective and we have good intentions. But not everybody's intentions are necessarily aligned. So find people uh, that, can, that, can, that can help. Um, we need to safeguard our training and our, our data and our examples uh, critically, and we also need to subject our models and our data uh, to peer review. And in my mind, that's a big one. I just can't understand why we'll create drugs, do a study, and that study, before it even uh, gets off uh, the ground, it's subject typically to something called an IRB, an independent review board. But we don't do that for AI. Right? And AI is making decisions, uh, where we have models that are making decisions about your credit, uh, whether or not you're going to get insurance, how long or if you're going to get incarcerated. I mean, we, I mean it's, it's pervasive. But yet, you know, the models are proprietary. No one necessarily looks at the, at, at, at the training data. And so, in my estimation, we have a lot of people that are talking about regulation. I know that there are several companies that are putting together different consortiums, but an independent review board uh, where you could basically have your model and your data, IRB approved, um, makes sense. And I think it makes a lot of sense as we start to contemplate potential liability. Because someone's going to make a mistake, uh, someone's going to be denied something, and the AI is going to be, or, or the system is going to be a, a call to account. And the same type of negligence that applies to uh, anything else that you would do in business will apply to your model and it will apply to your data. So in that respect, um, just from the standpoint of protection, we probably want to do something there. I've got, I think, five minutes left. and I definitely want to leave time for, um, for questions, so thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, I, I think that, that, to your point, I don't think that we look at data and we don't hold the data accountable as, as, as we should. I think we, we, we and, 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 and we should. Um, you know, everybody focuses on the models, you know, what, we're, what the models are doing, but the fact of the matter is most models now, or a lot of the models, I should say, are, are becoming so complex it's very difficult to do that. People need to think about the data, how it's sourced, uh, and what the implications are. Um, to your point about uh, a banking model, 
we worked on one at, at, at Element Data uh, where it's, it's basically um, a application um, uh, determination and, and that particular model, one of the things that we did is we went through and we looked to make sure, to understand, were, did, was the system um, echoing any bias uh, in, the, in the system? So we looked at the, now the issue was there can be um, social bias that becomes inherent in the data itself. So you can't necessarily change the data to, so, so uh, for a particular neighborhood, for instance, if someone's applying, um, there, and, there's a, and the machine says, well, there's a, there's a higher likelihood or propensity for that person uh, to, um, you know, there, there should be default, then we won't, you know, so, and it might turn out that that is a uh, largely minority uh, community. So, you know, it, it's, it, it is a very difficult question around, you know, the things that are present in the data, there are underlying social reasons why those things are there. So do we try to address them? Well, that's not necessarily our job. The one golden rule, right, is, you know, don't mess with the data, right? I mean, the, the data is, is supposed to be the one thing as a data scientist that is supposed to be your, your true north. Um, but you still need to be able to say, I've looked at it and these are the issues, and ask yourself why. Why is this the case? So that you can defend it. Because, I mean, you, you have to be able to do that. But a lot of people, do, we don't. We just... You know, we're so eager to make money or get the project done or whatever the case might be, we just plow forward. And what happens is um, these models are going to become increasingly sophisticated. And so, if, and, and so the things and the decisions that we make, they're going to carry over. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Any other questions? Yes. Right. So it doesn't. So do you see or do you have an opinion on how we can maybe do this a little bit better and bring this more to the forefront? Yeah. Uh, I think this will probably be like the one time I invoke Ronald Reagan. Trust but verify. <laughs> right? Um, so, um, and, and, that's what, and that's what you have to do. I mean, we do the same thing. I mean, we go out and like for this, this, this healthcare project and, and we, you know, gather publicly available data and private data and we pay for it. And we go through a tremendous amount of work trying to verify that data. And so, what, and actually, that's one of the things that you can use your AI and your ML for, right? To, to basically look at your data to, to find the inconsistencies in your data. I mean, that's what these machines are great at, pattern recognition. Today, AI, neural AI, pattern recognition. Tomorrow, right, it's, it's basically about prediction and more about behavioral prediction. Um, any other questions? Yes. You have not addressed the elephant in the room. So AI might render 80% of the humanity dispensable. And then, uh, now because AI and machine can reflect it. Right? So what will be the social impact of that? Even universal basic income is not going to solve it because those people will have no purpose in life except just consuming that income. Well, I mean, it's so that's, it's, that's an it's interesting observation. So I refer to ANI now as the equivalent of a technology migrant worker doing the work that we don't necessarily want to do. I see AGI, however, as completely different. And, and when I say that, also not necessarily getting the respect. AGI is a little bit different. AGI has the potential to do your work, to truly do your work, right? And outthink you and, and do it far better than you could. It's, it's not just doing it at scale, right? It's doing it far better. Um, and ASI, which I hope doesn't come to pass, but more than likely will, that's different. ASI means that we have to be accountable. And I think that if we had to justify our existence to a machine at that level, we'd probably lose because we're not very good at sharing wealth, we like to destroy things, like the planet. Um, I mean, we would have a very difficult time justifying um, why we should be allowed to run things uh, in comparison to a super, uh, a super intelligence. And so at that point in time, and I don't want to get too philosophical, I mean, we've had religion since the beginning of, of time, right? We, we've always prayed to something. And, and 
you know, the question then becomes one of, at an, at an ASI, have we now created a, a new god, right, that we then have to worship? So are we, at the, are, are, are we currently the, the prophets, if you will, writing, you know, writing, the, writing the religion of, of AI? It's a deep, deep question. I'm sorry, because I know it's right after lunch. But the point, the po the point being that um, irrespective of that, you, you still have to, what, the things that we do now matter, and we have to be responsible for what we create today. And that maybe, that, maybe that's our hope for the future, that if we're responsible today, um, we'll be able to better shape what happens tomorrow. On that note, let's thank Mr. Davis. Thank you.